Good evening. There we go. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is Anya Kreitney, and I'm a specialist in the library's Literary Initiatives Division. I'm very pleased to welcome you to an evening with Simon Shama and Atul Gawande. This evening is part of our wildly popular Live at the Library series on Thursday nights, in which we open the Thomas Jefferson Building from 5 to 8 p.m. in order to better acquaint the public with the library's tremendous resources. For any first timers in the audience today, we hope you get a chance to walk into the main reading room, which you can access on the floor just above us. You can also enjoy happy hour snacks and drinks available for purchase upstairs. Before we begin the obligatory housekeeping, could you please turn off your cell phones, I will do the same, and any other electronic devices that would interfere with today's event. Second, please note that this program is being recorded and by participating, you give us permission for future use of the recording. Now, tonight's event will feature a discussion on Simon Shama's latest book, and because I like a show and tell, Foreign Bodies, Pandemics, Vaccines, and the Health of Nations. It's an important book that argues that nature and its tiny agents, bacteria, viruses, spores, fungi, and the like, are the phenomena that are actually in control of the human condition. And yet, don't be deterred by what may appear as our human powerlessness, Shama says. Science and scientists offer us history-proven, real-world solutions to accommodate, or you could say compensate, for our intrusions and interventions in our world. In the book, Shama Goes Global, he admonishes us to remember that the health of the world depends on the healthiness of geopolitical zeal and collaboration. And because we're all in this together, Shama reminds me, I would be remiss if I glossed over the library's contribution to understanding the state of pandemics. The American Folklife Center, which is here in the Library of Congress, documents and shares the many expressions of human experience to inspire and perpetuate living cultural traditions. They are collecting stories about COVID-19 as part of the COVID-19 American History Project. The goal is to create an archive that documents Americans' experiences with COVID-19 so future generations can better contextualize this specific moment in time. I invite you to contribute your own COVID-19 story to the initiative, and you can do so by visiting this website. It's a little bit of a mouthful, so I'll repeat it twice. Guides.loc.gov forward slash COVID hyphen 19 hyphen folk life. One more time, guides.loc.gov forward slash COVID hyphen 19 hyphen folk life. All these stories are being recorded via StoryCorps and will be archived right here within the Library of Congress. So, before I dispense with our bios of our most distinguished guests, I want to let you know that there will be a Q&A at the end of the conversation. Please use the standing mics. They're a little hard to see uh, right now, but they're down here in the front. Um, and if you could, try and stay three paces back from the person who's actually at the microphone so the cameras can continue to capture the event tonight. Uh, after the Q&A, Simon will sign books in the Woodall Pavilion, which is in a room just adjoining the auditorium, just, just that away. Um, and now, the obligatory bios. Simon Shama is professor of art history and history at Columbia University. His award-winning books include Scribble, 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 Rough Crossings, The Power of Art, the Embarrassment of Riches, an Interpretation of Dutch Culture in the Golden Age, and the History of Britain, a trilogy, among many others. He's also a lauded documentarian with highly successful programs on BBC, PBS, the History Channel, which includes the Emmy Award winning The Power of Art. Simon will be interviewed by Dr. Otul Gawande, who is the Assistant Administrator for the Global Health at the US Agency for International Development. Prior to joining the Biden-Harris administration, Gawande was a practicing surgeon and professor at Harvard Medical School. 
He's also the co-founder of CIC Health, a public benefit corporation that provided COVID testing and vaccine capability nationally. Of course, he's a writer himself, <clears throat> the author of best-selling books such as Complications, Better, The Checklist Manifesto, and Being Mortal. Please join me in welcoming Simon Sharma and Atul Gawande. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. I'm so excited to have this conversation. Me too. You make, uh, you make so much of history that you think is familiar, unfamiliar, and reading pandemic uh, foreign bodies, um, I not only, I thought I knew the story of cholera until you told mm. the story, uh, and smallpox, and, and, and on and on. There's so much we'll get, get to well, talk about. Well, if it surprised you, actually, it may be because I got it wrong, you know. <laughs> Always that possibility, you know. Well, uh, you uh, offered to start us off with a, a few sure. minutes of um, a little bit of uh, uh, show and tell. I, I'm going to do that, yes, yes. I'm, I'm going to wait for a minute before I put the first picture on. Um, no, th this was um, a, a book I had, hadn't really anticipated writing, but I think actually when the lockdown happened, this was, we all have, you know, the My Pandemic book confession, and um, I, it wasn't just that, I think, but um, when you get to um, what a good writer, friend of mine, no longer with us, called the springtime of senility, which is I'm definitely in that season right now, <laughs> excited, but doomed, essentially. Um, <laughs> when you get to that stage, um, you begin to think what you're doing as an historian, I think, actually. And there was a, a fantastically, my wife was quite cross about this, but I rather liked it. Um, a good friend of mine who I've made some television with and who's a very good um, African-British historian called David Olashoga was described in a newspaper article as um, being now the face of BBC history, now that Simon Sharma is nearing 80 which is true, and um, so I didn't mind it at all. I, I, I roared with laughter, not my wife. And, but when you, when, you are, <laughs> when you are nearing 80, you say, okay, it's history for a kind of, you can do what you've been doing. It can be a, an escape here. There's plenty of horrible things, and it's an abysmal time for us to want a kind of period costume escape. Um, or actually ought you to be grasping the nettle, which I, in my view is what, what the Western tradition of writing history, not to be too Eurocentric about it, but Thucydides writing the Peloponnesian Wars had been a protagonist, and it, it, it's a huge exercise in almost bitter self-criticism, that great tragic catastrophe of the expedition to Syracuse at the end. So I, I do think now that actually with um, nearing 80 as one does, um, uh, you have to write, even, even if you risk a certain kind of bloated sanctimoniousness, I think you have to write something that is connected to the world's troubles. And um, the book I thought I was writing was a book about, um, it was sort of, you know, um, I've, I've spent a lot of my life writing about the mysteries of allegiance, allegiance to a religion or to a nation, particularly to a nation. So I was writing a book about the culture of nationalism, what happened to music in the 19th century, in the hands of Smetana or um, Elgar or uh, um, Wagner, in fact. And, um, and I was getting more and more depressed by the triumph of populist nationalism. And I thought, okay, there's one moment where um, this isn't true, and it would be the founding of the World Health Organization. Um, pandemic lockdown happened. The World Health Organization has a very good online, as it turned out, historical archive. And it led me to something um, called, uh, with the appealing title, of the international sanitary conferences that were founded, which I hadn't heard about. And these were the first international organizations that were not to do with the military alliance or, or a peace treaty. And it led me to, uh, they were founded to, f to fight cholera, to, to discuss whether or not, and the major nations, but then the not so major nations also joined in, in the middle of the 19th century, to decide in effect whether there should be a concerted international agreement about quarantine. 
which merely ran, need I hardly say, into the British objection that anything that stopped the economy, the trade between Britain and India, ought not to be counted. So the British were very keen that the way you dealt with cholera was just by disinfecting the specific sites that were conta fecally contaminated. And it, it, they, they were insisted that cholera is not a contagious disease. And in some extent, two people in the same room um, are not going, it's not a respiratory disease, are not going to transmit cholera, but should they shake hands, they might, actually. <laughs> Any, or should they sit on a, a contaminated um, piece of upholstery in a railway train or something, they could. This man you're looking at um, believed that there had to be an internationally agreed system of, uh, of, um, of quarantines, if necessary. And, his, and he wrote an enormous book, which was really a kind of geography of epidemiology. It was extraordinary. He himself went to the hottest of hotspots. And he is Marcel Proust's father, Adrian Proust. So it occurred to me in a kind of slightly, you know, um, New Yorker cartoon way that it was interesting that um, both of us are New Yorker veterans. Um, the interesting that he was the father of the most famous hypochondriac in all of European literature, <laughs> really. Um, and I'd always thought of him as a kind of slightly comic figure, the overbearing doctor father. And in fact, he turned out to be extraordinarily um, uh, interesting, in, rather intrepid, put himself at risk. He shows up in Bombay, for example, Mumbai, as we call it now, in early 1897, at the height of a bubonic plague um, epidemic, which bubonic plague is the, the fifth wave of it. We've all forgotten. It killed nearly 30 million people between 1892 and the late 1920s. So Adrian Proust then, when I, you know, there are certain things the writer in, in you just makes you then, you start to kind of sweat in a good way and drool slightly and you, you can kind of feel a story coming on. And then you need either a good editor, in my case, a fantastic, my wife's a scientist. And I said, I'm feeling there may be something dangerously booky going on here. And she said, <laughs> she said yeah, there probably is. And I call my wife, who's a geneticist, my bullshit backstop. She said, but you're going to have to do a lot of homework. And I said, well, you'll help me. And, and that's how I, I got into it. I, I wrote the chapter about Proust and then went back to this woman and this moment, which is in the early... How am I doing, Atul? You have to No, 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 me. go, go, okay. go. Um, and... Um, this Stop. Well, okay. <laughs> keep, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Wise guy. I, I get to tell the jokes. <laughs> and um, I, it, this is a woman who was the great promoter of smallpox inoculation in Britain in the 1720s. And she was absolutely remarkable. And I began to think about that. It's the first moment where what is incredibly, as we still have to grapple with, those of us on the side of science, as it were, um, people's disbelief that actually inviting toxic matter into a perfectly healthy body on the grounds that you're... And because none of them in the 1700s know there was such a thing as an immune system, let alone actually how our bodies cope with invasive infections. Um, so in the 1700s, to actually um, give yourself smallpox in a mild dose in order to avoid the possibility of dying or being disfigured was an extraordinary counterintuitive thing to do, and she was determined to do it. She was the wife of the British ambassador in Constantinople. She had nearly died from a very bad smallpox attack. Her brother had died of it. Um, and she was very badly disfigured. She was a published literary celebrity, Mary was. Um, she knew Alex Alexander Pope and people like that. And um, in Constantinople, she noticed that people were not disfigured by smallpox. Smallpox was killing one in six of those who contracted it. And um, uh, it was a horrifying thing. So she learned that actually it had been a common practice particularly among the upper classes, but not exclusively, um, to actually bring, there's no other way, sorry about this during, just before your dinner, everybody, bring pus, to take some pus from a living 
uh, smallpox victim and to either abrade your arm or your feet or your legs or you could puncture your arm as we do with vaccination, inoculation. Um, and nobody was disfigured at all. Um, had, you know, and, the, and the death mortality rate was clearly much lighter. So she actually inoculated when her husband was away with the Sultan. Um, her six-year-old boy, and it, he had a little fever, and he had a very few pustules, and he was okay. And then she did the same thing to her three-year-old daughter when got back to England. I was immediately attacked as an unnatural mother by doctors and by the clergy, by the clergy, who said what kind of, you know, uh, it's only it, the issues of life and death were in God's hands. So she fought an extraordinary campaign for many years, and... Um, she, so she, the, the, she, her story is quite well known, actually. But and uh, what was very striking was the way in which the practice of inoculation, a hundred years before Edward Jenner's vaccination, vaccination etymologically, you all know, um, was because it, using cowpox, you know, vash, that vaccina. So. Um, so she w was another kind of feature of the story, and I'll just, the last one, quickly. Um, this man seemed to be, it was in, he, he was sort of, for me, quite a heroic figure. He's called Vladimir Havkin, he's a Ukrainian Jew, um, and he arrives at the only university Jews could go to in the late 19th century, um, Odessa in Ukraine. And um, he immediately becomes an extremely radical student. There's a picture of him in Odessa in 1884. And he was part of a group of students who armed the Jewish community with guns as well as knives against the oncoming pogrom, which duly happened in 1881. He's thrown into prison three times. He's caught with guns on him. And he's got out of prison due to the intervention of his um, science um, supervisor, his doctor Vada, Eli Mechnikov, from a converted Jewish family who wins the Nobel Prize for demonstrating basically how the immune system works, called the father of immunology. Um, and actually, how many of you tomorrow morning will eat yogurt for breakfast? <laughs> well, Eli Mechnikov, actually not very many of you, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, it, it was Mechnikov who first believed that Bulgarian yogurt actually would, um, would, uh, you know, uh, would assure you of exceptional longevity. He didn't live long enough to have that borne <laughs> out, <laughs> unfortunately. He didn't die young. He would have been talking about microbiome. Yeah, he, w he did actually... Um, Probiotics was his coinage, apparently. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, Hafkin gets, uh, he gets out of the slammer. The Russian secret police own a, uh, open a big fire to him. And Mechnikov says to him, I can't go on getting you out of trouble. I'm getting in trouble as a result. And Mechnikov goes to the Institut Pasteur in Paris in the first year of its extraordinary career and brings Hafkin with him in a lowly spot and very much against the odds, I'll leave it there for a second, um, Hafkin develops an effective and safe vaccine against cholera. It's an amazing thing. Um, and n because cholera is waning in Europe at that time, he knows he needs to take it to an area, namely India, where um, cholera is an interesting story, but a bit complicated. Uh, in parts of India, cholera was endemic, and therefore people have built up what we darkly call herd immunity, really. But there are areas, of particularly the big cities, where um, it was epidemic and people hadn't, for whatever reasons, built up that degree of immune resistance. So there were very, very severe epidemics, really, of cholera. And Hafkin goes out there, not least because, having developed the vaccine, he wants to, what we now call randomized comparative trials, he wants to take populations, in his case, only volunteers, of people living in identical social circumstances and, you know, person A has the vaccine, person B doesn't, and then you compare the data. So here he is. I, I'll, this is just the last... I'm actually a photograph at the end of our talk, Atul, if I could, that yeah. one of his, but I'll just end at the moment um, with this one. Here he is um, in a busti, which is a kind of semi... It's a tenement area. They still exist in Calcutta. Um, it looks like a village, but it's not. It's sort of an area of open space inside the metropolitan area of Calcutta. 
and he's dressed to the nines. He was not only, you know, a, a formidable microbiologist, but something of a dandy as well. And he's vaccinating that essentially these are and you can see these are long huts, long houses, in which would house between 20 and 30 people. So he's got, if they're volunteering, a population where he can actually do some serious comparative trials. And um, he wants to, he, he, is, he is really has a kind of vocation to take um, science, this science, which is very young, to the poor. And these are migrant workers from elsewhere, in, or from Bengal, and a lot of them from Bihar and Orissa. And you can see there, you know, there are people who are fearful and upset. And with him, very importantly, there's just one other white doctor, a man called William Simpson, who's a great friend and champion. Um, and around him, uh, there are three assistant doctors. One of them is the Calcutta Municipal Health Officer, the gentleman in the dark costume, and the other one is also another sanitary public health officer. There, Hafkin is training assistants as he goes, and this is the beginning of an extraordinary odyssey, thousands and thousands of miles all over India, to actually take vaccines to populations that are afflicted by it. And this is a campaign, he contracts malaria while vaccinating workers on the big tier states in eastern India and Assam, and comes back to England. And he's already then, he's um, born in, 60, uh, in 1860, so he's, um, yeah, he's in, he's, he's in his, at this point he's in his mid-30s. So he's young, he has no support from the British government or the British medical staff at all. Um, and then there was a, quite an epic story after this happens, both of great success and a rather kind of tragic end. So I'll, I'll stop there, I think. That's already it's, it, the tro, I think. It, it you know. is immediately, you know, there's so much fascinating in the book. You lead off saying biological imperatives rather than the emperors of construction and destruction right. are our true rulers. And then go through, you know, 30 million dead uh, from, from, uh, from this particular outbreak, right. 50 million dead in, in the yeah. Spanish uh, flu of right. 1918, which, as you point out, wasn't so Spanish. <laughs> right. <laughs> Since it was Sp Spanish flu begins in that famous province of Spain called Kansas, actually, in, yeah. case, you want, in case you wanted. Yeah. But we're still, we're still reading Thucydides about the Peloponnesian yeah. War. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Why do we not read or care about these uh, these other episodes in history if these are the things that rules? You know, we, we, we go to museums of Pompeii, but we don't go to museums of of these epidemics or, or what sweat or, or think about these heroes. You know, yeah. I, here I'm in the public health field. This has been a big part of what I do. And I did not know the story of Adrian Proust. I, I know the story right. of Jon Snow. I thought cholera right. was... You know, defined by this person, but of course, it's a whole, it's a whole right. range of people who are making these amazing contributions. Hafkin is a is a heroic story of a vaccine for cholera, a vaccine for bubonic plague, right. uh, and then and then a tragic yeah. or story of the bureaucracy right. crushing him, and uh, and so my first place to wonder is, what what is it about not wanting to read about these things so much? Well, I think. Um you know, I don't know. I, th I think th there have been uh, it, it, the challenge, I suppose, for medical history, and I, I say this very, you know, it's not my beat, so I'm very much a rookie in this. And scientists and other medical historians have been extremely kind. Um, and, uh, but, so I, so I feel slightly, you know, I don't want to sort of deliver a lecture, but it does depend on um, the grip, the literary grip. I mean, you are extraordinary in that, in that respect. But it depends on literary grip. And to actually make um, this essentially tragic story, which will have st elements of survival in it as well, um, as powerful as the stories of revolutions and battles and politics as well. And it has been done. Um, that's why I demur slightly from your assumption at all. In the, in the history of the, of the Peloponnesian Wars, as you, the, the, the single most extraordinarily terrifyingly dramatic moment is the plague in Athens, where Thucydides, it's only about, if any of you haven't, and I, I, when I came to America a long time ago and started to teach in American colleges in 1980, I noticed that the Thucydides was very often 
part of a core curriculum. He certainly was at Columbia, but only for that famous speech of Pericles about the reasons why it would be seemly and good um, in order to die for your country. Nobody actually seemed to draw people's attention to this astonishing coloratura, six or seven pages, about the absolute collapse of all social and ethical norms. It was kind of world of beast against beast, really, you know, in extremis of terror that happens in Athens. Same thing happened with the Black Death. There are not many books of contemporaries about the Black Death. Um, there's the great Italian 19th century novel called The Betrothed, Di Promessi Sposi, which all anyone who's grown up in Italy um, complains they were forced to read at school, but it has an extraordinary account of what the plague was like in Milan at the end of it. But the great example of plague writing, um, which people did read, is, um, is Boccaccio. Um, and you know, Boccaccio's great De Camerone begins in a terrifying moment of plague, and rather wonderfully, the storytelling organized by women that begins in the Church of Santa Croce is an attempt to not so much run away, but kind of celebrate the lusty and, and not necessarily lusty joys of life, to sort of em embrace life at the height of death. But the book begins with an absolutely horrific, really very upsetting account of what the plague did in, in Florence. And I think we have, you know, people read Jared Diamond's book was a huge bestseller. Um, David Quammen, if any of you don't know his writing, is an extraordinary writer, wrote a book about zoonotic diseases called Spillover, um, which is a remarkable book. And, and he has amazing narrative power. He's a and Richard science. Preston's Hot Zone, yeah, of course. Richard Preston's Hot Zone was a huge bestseller. Yeah. Um, David Quammen wrote a book, very good book, about the early terrifying months of COVID called Breathless as well. So I think it happens, but I, the, the real answer to your question after my characteristic... We've all become... 19, we don't want to remember and talk about that's COVID, it. you know? That's it. That's it. People really want to get on with their lives and they want to forget about it. They don't want to feel... Um, I, I, th I think my sales have definitely suffered from this shit timing that I actually, you know, <laughs> people rather read about anything except actually this particular subject. But, um, but I think it's, it's entirely understandable that people want it. But of course, it is incredibly, you know, um, at the heart of the book, as in a lot of your writing, is the issue not just really of producing something scientifically majestic and then allowing it to you know, get delivered into all of our lives, into the community at large. The story of vaccination and the health of nations is a story of persuasion. And we know from the experience of the first year, particularly in COVID, and we're still knowing this, we have two candidates running as anti-vax candidates for the President of the United States, Robert Kennedy Jr. Um, and um, Ron DeSantis. You know, Ron DeSantis is Surgeon General in Florida. I'm sure this didn't escape your attention. Told people under 65 not to take the so-called booster vaccine, and not, it's not a so-called vaccine. I mean, it's actually a kind of new, by so-called, um, it's, it, it's a bivalent, it's no longer monovalent, that, I won't go into that. <laughs> but, um, it, it, but not to take the vaccine. And I, I was saying to Atul, how many of you have either had the latest round of COVID or know someone who has? Yeah, uh, quite a lot of you, right, exactly. So if you have elderly parents or people manage, you know, do make sure they go and get it. But, but famously, I think we'll bear this out or not, the uptake in this vaccine has been incredibly disappointing. Well, that's that, the, the, the fascinating thing. My, one of my dominant reactions reading the entire book was everything I thought was crazy about COVID uh, and like, what is wrong with our society today um, has been wrong for centuries. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, it's what's wrong with right. human beings. Like, you know, the smallpox story is great. It's, it's the story of a folk cure yeah. that has been circulating primarily by women in the Levant. Women have been the inoculators. Been the inoculators. Yeah, that's right. Taking and, 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 and rubbing the pox on their right. children and, um, and, and, 
for it took almost two centuries to roll out and truly be accepted by the right. medical establishment, the scientific. Right. There was it wasn't really scientific establishment for a while there, but the the tell, telling the story of the, you you had this great line here that um, uh, that. Uh, in 1706, Dr. Edward Terry, physician to the English factory in Aleppo, but also resided for years in the European trading colony of Pera in Constantinople, reported that an old Greek woman had assured him he had, she had personally inoculated upwards of 4,000 people, all without any ill effects. And this figure of the old Greek woman became the protagonist right. of nearly all early smallpox inoculation narratives. And that, um, that story of the kindly pock finding yeah. its way to uh, Scotland and the United States and elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so part of the story in COVID was, uh, you know, folk cures being dismissed by uh, right. the, the scientific establishment and also found to be wanting. Um, and, uh, you know, the story goes both ways. Two of your heroes, especially Hafkin, is an ignored scientific expert right. and almost, you know, uh, uh, you know, almost crucified for his, um, the work he was doing, especially around the bubonic plague. And then the other was instead, you know, th this was scientists being ignored and we had our flavor of that. Right. And then you also had, uh, in this case, the scientists not accepting a folk cure. What, what is the upshot about the, the human nature of what happens when an invisible killer right. that doesn't mm. kill everybody, takes time, and, uh, and you unfold it through numerous cases. Mm. Did you feel like there's a pattern to what happens to human beings under those circumstances that leads to people exploiting it rather than yeah. grabbing onto the solutions? Yeah, it, it, I, I think the, the, you know, the margins of acceptability really shift. What struck me as a big surprise in the research was that in the scientific, well, in the community generally, in the 1700s, there was actually more openness to thinking about the experience of cultures that were not like yours than there was in the 19th century, in the 1800s, when, and that is a function of the assumptions of imperial superiority, really. What's really, what was really, again, very um, happily surprising to me uh, was the following, that the Royal Society, which was the great, you know, the great pandrandrums, the elite of every kind of science in London, founded originally in the 1660s, were prepared to hear from and people like Tarry's story, but also um, two physicians, both were um, Greco, they were Greeks, but they'd been to the University of Padua, one called Emanuele Timoni, the other Giacomo Pilarini, and they reported on this practice and its effects, but were reporting anecdotally, essentially. Um, and the Royal Society was prepared to listen to what they have to say. The papers were read. And move on a little, you know, just a few years later, you have the secretary of the Royal Society, who also is the editor of its published transactions, an extraordinary figure called James Durin, who was an early epidemiological statistician, essentially, in contact with physicians and doctors and surgeons, who the lowlier, essentially the artisanal doctors all over Britain, to say, could you report actually in your local areas who's been inoculated, who hasn't? And one of them, a, a real, another local hero called Thomas Nettleton, who works in Halifax in Yorkshire, literally went round street to street, house to house, discovering and uh, trying to do a very crude early version of a comparative trial, essentially. And then Durin produces and publishes and prints these remarkable statistical tables showing the effectiveness of inoculation. So it's this kind of weird, I mean, or rather, un, for me, unanticipated union, really, between um, people trained in assumptions of European scientific and medical superiority being prepared to be open to um, what was empirically reported to be possible. It then did take, you know, um, two or three generations for it to be more widely accepted. But by the time you get to the 1760s, not least because a very ingenious family called the Suttons were offering inoculation 
at much more at much cheaper rates. Why am I talking about rates? Um, is because when doctors signed on to become inoculators in Britain, they told prospective patients that they needed two weeks of prep beforehand. I mean, our insurance companies today would have loved this, you know. And you were given complicated prescriptions about your diet, about whether you had to stay in bed, when you could get up, after you had the inoculation, you had another two weeks or so. Very few people could afford that. And you were charged by the physicians for the privilege. There is a remarkable figure in the middle of the book, a man called Angelo Gatti, Italian as he sounds, who became a kind of celebrity inoculator in Paris. He was adopted by some of the more um, uh, radical, the philosophe in the middle of the 18th century. And Angelo Gatti is the boy in the emperor's new clothes. He said, as a matter of fact, um, you physicians are not going to want to hear this, but it's completely, totally unnecessary to have. It doesn't matter what you eat. Um, it also, it doesn't matter the quantity of pus. It can be on the head of a pin. It should, it's subcutaneous, everybody. It doesn't need to be plunged into your muscle. And so he's hated both by anti-inoculators and by the physicians and actually run out of town in Paris. He says very movingly at one point, women play a big part in this book, he said, the most obvious people to inoculate children are their mothers. They can do this, well, we still haven't got around to that, have we? Um, the only in inoculation injection you can do at home seems to be ozone pick right now. <laughs> 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 um, he said, you could do this at home and while your children are sleeping, it is literally like the prick of a pin and it will work. He'd actually been witness to a comparative trial in a foundling hospital in, in London in the 1750s. Um, so the, everything seemed to me about who you seek out, um, who are the intermediaries for communities of the fearful or the defiant or the, the conspiracy-minded. And both Mary and Hafkin sought out religious leaders in particular. They knew that that was the path to um, disarming people's fearfulness and upset. And the Parsi community were very important. Um, excuse me, the Parsi community were very important, but the Ismaili community um, in Bombay, um, uh, whose head was the 19-year-old Aga Khan. Aga Khan was, became a friend of Hafkin's, and he inoculates in public his whole family. Hafkin would always inoculate himself first in sort of semi, almost theatrical performances to make sure everybody knew that he would be the first person to test whether a, a vaccine, vaccine was safe or not. Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the issue I was thinking as we went through the pandemic, I was thinking absolutely about the issue of persuasiveness and the kind of battle of wills on talk radio and Fox News and in White House briefing sessions, you know, about the, the agencies of persuasion, well, you, there you make which one, is your job. Well, you make one argument in uh, here that I want to profile, but I'm going to go to questions after this. So if you want to come down to the microphones here uh, for the, uh, we can take probably a couple of questions at least. Um, uh, and, uh, and while you're coming for, to the microphones, I will ask this one. So building on the point you were making about their turning to religious leaders, you point out that the seeds of the British response to the plague in India right. ended up being the seeds that cost the empire. Right. They were um, bringing scientific knowledge, uh, wanting to inspect people for whether they have the buboes, the big swelling right. in your armpits or in your groin that uh, indicated that you have the bubonic plague. And in so doing, you were bringing these outsiders in, asking women to, you know, show their armpit, yeah, or uh, groin, in a, in a or groin in a yeah. in ways that were seen as so indecent, people would rather die, right. and that was seen as, you know, backward and ignorant, and therefore, um, uh, it was imposed on them. And so you say, thus, the two founding elements of popular Indian nationalism, the forces which would break the Raj, social and religious outrage 
and mass strikes and de demonstrations were both born in the epidemic. Right, and you, I think they were. I, there's they there's were. a theme that also echoes with uh, right. what, what we've uh, endured with right. COVID as well. Right, absolutely. This is a slide actually, if you can see it, um, of um, uh, the, 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 the British medical community in, in uh, imperial medical community in India was not interested in learning, in doing um, crash course in virology and microbacteriology, as it was called then, or, or microbiology. They were busy doing what they knew how to do. They were fighting the last war. They were fighting the cholera, which is often about, um, should be about disinfection. So everything they did on a military style, what you're looking at is a morning lineup of military disinfection that would go around Bombay um, with carbolic acid sluicing down houses, um, sometimes burning upholstery, dragging people out. People were dragged off railway trains, the Indian poor essentially. It, the poor were mostly the people who were struck by um, plague because they lived in quarters and they um, you know, they kept stock on the ground floor and rats lived amidst the corn and rice and fleas lived amidst the rats and parasites lived in, <laughs> the bacillus lived inside the flea and so on. So they were most bitterly affected. But um, families were split up, plague camps were set up, plague hospitals, and sometimes whole houses were broken down like this. Here is, um, and this, this is an extraordinary document called the Plague Visitation Album, which was compiled by the British medical authorities in Bombay to congratulate themselves on what a swell job they were doing. So there are lots of images of, um, and I shouldn't be too critical, there were a lot of devoted nurses and doctors actually, but the photographer, this was a man called Captain Claude Moss, he gradually uh, went native in a good way and began to produce terrifying images of what happened to the poor. This is the Sidi community who are Africans who were brought as slaves actually by Arab slave traders across the Indian Ocean in the 17th century. And here is a, became house servants but dock workers. And here is a tragic image really of a couple who've lost their little boy. You wonder what the photographer was doing really. You know, you can see the freshly dug grave at the front of the picture into which the little boy is clearly going to be put. And I'm sure they've been paid a, a, you know, a rupee or two really to have this very intrusive photograph taken. Here is Hafkin on the street doing street vaccinations, again, only with volunteers. Wonderful, very unusual photograph actually and again a rather broken down part of Bombay. You can see there's a figure under an umbrella and that's a, a woman doctor we know quite a lot about, a wonderful woman called Alice Courthorn who develops her, her vaccination buggy um, in towns of the Carnatic area region. Um, and Alice knew all about persuasion. She would actually set up lecture demonstrations with interpreters speaking um, Malayalam or Gujarati when she went north. And um, at the end of the lecture, uh, vaccinators were at the back of the room, um, ready to take you know, people who were prepared to be vaccinators. We actually have the same for you. No, not really. <laughs> actually, if we, we should have done, really. <laughs> um, so the issue of persuasion is, um, is, is, is really important uh, throughout. But, that's led me to completely forget your question at all. <laughs> it, it was about the seeds of empire. Oh yeah, that's uh, right. The, no, that's right. The very, the there was, of empire. Yeah, no, there was a very important, but the intrusiveness was such that um, it, it, th there were strikes and hence the importance of persuasion. When that didn't happen, there were strikes and riots, there were attacks on plague hospitals, very tragically. Um, and the, chief commissioner of public health in the city of Pune, about 200 miles east of Bombay, was assassinated on the day of the celebration of Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee at the end of June 1897. That caught the British attention. So when Hafkin came along and actually proposed a prophylactic vaccine, um, they started to pay attention to him. And at long last, they gave him space in a redundant government house in an, air, in, a, in an area of South Bombay called Parel. And you're looking at the incubation chamber of the 
bottles of plague vaccine, which again then were taken all over India until Hathkeen runs into terrible trouble. Shall I say a word about that? Or Let's or see not. if there's That's a question questions. in yeah. case someone yeah. wants to come up and ask. Oh, here we are. We have one. Please. Thanks for a great uh, conversation. You've been talking about how I think there are certain themes and dynamics around pandemics that recur over historical yeah. time. But then there's also a sense that the configuration of the modern age and how we're um, able technologically and how we're configured mm. geopolitically, do you think that's interacting in interesting ways with these recurrent historical themes? What, what about COVID happening now yeah. has changed how it's unfolding yeah. in a way that surprises you perhaps? Well, incredibly, um, thank you for that very good question. Um, you know, when I finished writing the book, or even before I finished writing it, really, um, I was struck by, I mean, I guess it's really possibly a depressing truism about our present human condition. Um, and that is the following, that we are at the same time capable of staggering feats of scientific ingenuity producing not just vaccines, but the new technology methodology of messenger RNA vaccines. So we're that kind of human being. And we're also the kind of human being that, that as um, President of the United States, seems to recommend bleach as a good way to get rid of. It's not, not just that. That's sort of too facetious, really. But we're, we're, we're still a cartload of primitive suspicions and paranoias and fearfulness, which those facing the Black Death and smallpox would instantly have recognized. And the philosophers of the Enlightenment, like Voltaire, who went through an attack of smallpox, would have been disconcerted by on the assumption that the spread of knowledge would see off the kind of uninformed um, hostility to the invasiveness, as its enemies represented, of an inoculation of something which is, you know, which punctures um, uh, the skin, the bodily casing. It was very striking to me that a lot of the um, fake recommended drugs, ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, um, were orally um, available um, for worming or for, for your case of COVID. Um, and there was something, and remains something really, about um, injection, about actually, that, that was another reason for the slightly clumsy, um, you know, double sense, really, of the title Foreign Bodies, which then remains. So, we're, in so many respects, we're facing challenges to the sovereignty of knowledge. Um, one thing the Surgeon General in Florida said is, you who are not over 65, trust your common sense rather than science, the expertise of scientists. That was a, it's a Surgeon General who went to Harvard Medical School, which doesn't say very much for Harvard Medical School, was that you? <laughs> I have to say. Um, but it's, that's really shocking. So it's, it's an extraordinary thing that we're still kind of fighting these battles. And that the purchase, I mean, we made this inevitably tragic mistake about the internet, about the web. That, you know, Tim Berners-Lee, bless him, thought the web would be um, an extraordinary kind of, you know, magic bullet, that it would be the great guardian between um, truth and falsehood, you know. Um, and, of course, the web has become an ideal nesting place for echo chambers of madness and ignorance and conspiracy theories, because conspiracy theories, even if they go to the extent of assuming that the people who, who are wanting you to be vaccinated are Bill Gates and George Soros and a 5G chip is being inserted somehow into your body. And so that the, the, the kind of technology of communication we have now isn't necessarily on the side of knowledge, of empirically accumulated, demonstrated, tried out knowledge. And we haven't, I mean, that's, I'd love you to say something about that at all, because we haven't really managed to crack that terrifying problem. Do we have one more question that someone wants to ask? If not, I will, oh, here's one. Okay, good. Sorry to interrupt you. Thank you for this. Uh, I appreciate the humor. 
Uh, you had said that previously a lot of inoculators were able to recruit uh, religious voices to help yeah. persuade those to get inoculated. Yeah. Uh, obviously, in some cases, that backfired, like you had shown in a picture earlier yeah. in the case of India. Do you think that is something that we should be leveraging more uh, in today's no, society to uh, aid yeah. in the fight against COVID, or do you think that could also backfire, like in the case of India? Well, I think, I think people, you know, I mean, um, the United States is an intensely serious religious community, you know, really a nation. And therefore, I think the more help you can give, actually, from ministers of whatever faith, actually, you know, who are um, prepared to put their support behind science and actually to decide. There, there is, the United States was really born, let me put it this way, to another, thank you, very excellent question. Um, it was born with a split cultural personality. On the one hand, there is Thomas Jefferson for all his many vices, some of them seriousness, serious ones, was an absolute sort of, um, you know, great sucking machine of every kind of knowledge he could possibly have access to. Greatest achievement, he often said, was found in the University of Virginia. And so on the other hand, the United States was also born from the Great Awakening. Um, and from the intense legacy of religious experience. So you had marching through American history, it's definitely way into the 19th and still there, you have a kind of contest between the power of personal revelation, messages from God, and the power of non-theologically, non-revelatory derived understanding of the material circumstances of the universe. And that contest gets played out, I think, actually, um, with every generation that absolutely hasn't gone away. So, um, you know, if, in fact, science-friendly clergy can indeed be, you know, can say something, they probably do, actually, you know, and I'm sure they did when people were dying or on ventilators or suffering, horrifying death rates in those, that first terrifying spring. Probably they did, you would know that better than, than me at all. But yeah, that, that can't do any harm. And I should say that um, within the clergy, and I suspect that would be true now, um, the Mary Wortley Montague and others campaign to promote the safety as well as the efficacy of smallpox inoculation, which by the way, it, you had a one in six chance of dying if you caught it not being inoculated. You had a one in 50 chance of dying if you had been inoculated. It wasn't perfect. Vaccines often are, but that was you know, statistically demonstrable, extraordinary boon. But there was a fight between archbishops and bishops in England. <laughs> the anti-inoculation anti bishops were the louder ones, but there were also the Archbishop of Exeter, who deliberately preached a sermon to try and um, disarm the fears and worries and terrors that most people had about what it meant to put poison into your body to save your life. I suspect that would be true now, too. Simon, I want to say thank you for this uh, discussion. Um, I think it's time for us to wrap up. But I want to finish with a little bit of a brief story. So my current job, I, I um, put down the scalpel for a couple of years to lead global health at uh, USAID, where our job is to take on many, many of the health problems around the world, uh, both crises and um, uh, and trying to solve problems we haven't solved yet. So one of them is trying to finish the job on polio eradication. Oh, okay. 35 years into the effort to yeah. get, the, get, get the vaccine around the world enough right. that we finally eliminate it. And we're down to, for wild type polio, we've eliminated two of the three types of, of wild type polio, um, and it's down to 20 square uh, miles of, of area where we've had three, four years of we just can't seem to get it down. We're, we're, we're below 50 cases each year. We just can't get it down to zero. How many in Rockland County, <laughs> my neighbors? Well, that's, that's a, a, yeah. a vaccine. This is, this is a ver further variant. This is a vaccine, uh, a mutation of the vaccine itself that causes okay. uh, a, really? a complex. So the, a this really? vaccine-derived polio, okay. uh, that actually is out of Rockland County now, and, and, uh, uh, but is also one that has to be wiped out. But for the original va mm. polio, uh, which, you know, paralyzes one in 200 who get it. Yeah. Um, 
It is 20 square, square miles in uh, a village community in North Waziristan in Pakistan and in a few neighborhoods of Jalalabad. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've had uh, multiple polio workers killed when they try to enter those places. The, the governments themselves don't have uh, yeah. uh, direct control. And, uh, and it's also colored by the fact that when, when uh, the United States was able to get to, uh, 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 to Osama bin Laden, it was by sending uh, fake I, polio workers right. to right. capture DNA that allowed us to identify where, where uh, Osama was. bin Laden was. And so there is a deep distrust of their own governments, of the vaccine, and in one of those communities they also recognize that, that services don't come to them uh, but they come with for the polio vaccine, so we're going to hold out for uh, you to bring more services, more schools, more right. more more other resources. So it's it is the whole human experience wrapped up in uh, a mix of of myths about the vaccine, awareness about what it is, but wanting other services and uh, and and huge historical ties. And I feel like it is another chapter. I'd love to read. No, uh, from, at all. That from it's, I was just going to say, that's your next book. Clearly, <laughs> that's your next book. Don't get off that lightly. Thank you so much. I hope you will thank uh, you. please thank, uh, thank Simon for this amazing thank book and, uh, and join him for the signing afterwards. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.